uh, a young lady. She grew up here, man. That's a blessing. Proverbs chapter 3 continued our study about fear. And uh, we've covered the fear of God. And if you weren't here for Sunday school, I'm not going to reiterate it today. All the things that we covered. Brother Larry? Thank the Lord you're still here. <laughs> Lord God, son, I was getting worried about you. Amen. I've been praying for you. You've been feeling it? it Must have worked. You got here. Proverbs 3. Yes, sir. I'm fixing to have you light it up in prayer here in just a minute, okay? All right. Where'd Brother Richard at? Sitting up there in the crow's nest. You all need to be praying for that boy. He's not doing well. He's doing all he can to keep his nose above the water. And um, the top of that little bald head sitting up there. So you all be praying for Brother Richard. Faithful old saint. Been around a long time. Struggling a little bit. Give me... Uh, Proverbs 3, is that the verse there? I think that it starts off, trust in the Lord. Is that the one? Okay, let me see if I can remember that one. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge and he shall direct thy paths. Did I get that one right? Is that King James? Okay, I thought I was a living Bible there for just a minute. I wasn't sure. <laughs> All right, Brother Larry, take us to the throne room, would you? Well, it was great to be here tonight. Thank you for this beautiful building, Lord. Amen. We're here to worship in, Lord, that you provided so richly. Thank you, Lord. We know already you're in the very fires of this place. And I pray you saturate with your presence. Lord, we'll thank you for that forever. Amen. Lord, we're grateful for this hour, another time that the doors are open, Lord, that we can even be in church for the liberty that we have to come and to go. Uh, in this country as well, Lord, thus far. Thank you, Lord. You're still providing a preacher, Lord, men in the pulpit, Lord, to preach to us and give yes. us the word of God, Amen. rightly divided Amen. even, Amen. the Lord, that we might hear from the King James Bible. Thank you for the help we know. And in that same voice, Lord, we want to pray for those that are ailing. Yep. Lord, they're the ones that are under the weather, Lord, that the ones are in a bad way. God, I thank you for your mercy and your grace. And we pray for healing, Lord, and uh, Lord, further to that, and for grace. Well, we have to thank you for grace. Lord, without grace and without you and your shed blood, right. we'd not be able to even hear the word of God directly yeah. what we're yeah. hearing. Yeah. Yes. Lord, Lord, would you give us an ear for that? Open our hearts to it tonight. Thank you for being able to sit under the word of God being preached. Thank you for providing a man uh, to preach it, especially this place. God, we yes. give you the glory for for doing that for us, for his health even, and him being upright and of a sound mind to even preach the word of God. Thank you for that. I pray you'd help our hearts tonight. Thank you for being with us through this day. We pray for those that we've tried to help today. I pray God for a touch for all of them. And I, I just thank you, Lord, and we can't help but give you the, the glory for who you are in our lives yeah. and every step, Lord, that we take. Uh, Lord, for it weren't for you, We've been sidetracked bad. Yes, We've been far left and way far right. Yes, sir. But Lord, you've helped us in our steps. And Lord, you've given us somewhat of an understanding. Give us the, the, uh, the knowledge, God, to understand your word. So we thank you for all that you do in our lives. I pray, God, that you'd be, uh, that you'd be lifted up in word tonight. And God, we'd be able to give you praise. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. 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 Thank you. You can have a seat. I'm going to say this about fear. Fear inhibits your ability to trust God. Uh, you get fear of certain things that will cause you to not grow in the Lord. It will prevent your obedience. It will limit you to your own mindset. That passage there just below that in verse uh, 7, maybe it's 8 there, about the man being wise in his own conceits. It's directly contrary to what the Lord says. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him. And then the promise that comes with that is that if you do that, then he'll direct your paths. Uh, Hebrews chapter number 11 and verse number 6, I'll just read it to you. He says, But without faith it's impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he's a, reward, a rewarder of them that diligently what? 
seek Him. So you're on a constant journey to try to find the Lord in everything that you do. Everything you do, everything you say, every breath you take, so on and so forth. Where's the Lord in this? What does the Lord do? He says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart, lean not in all thy ways. He said, acknowledge Him. Preacher, can you carry that too far? I don't think you can carry it too far. Our problem is, generally speaking, we don't carry it far enough. Our problem is, is that we choose when and where to put Him in, like in our daytimer. Uh, I'm not real big on trying to tell people how much of the Bible they ought to read. I think sometimes uh, that changes with things that are going on in your life. But I think if you start off by learning and ingraining a really good habit in your life that you have a little bit of it every day, you'll have the better opportunity to have more of it later on in your life. If you don't start with a little bit, you'll never do a lot. The mistake a lot of people make is when it comes to reading the Bible is they try to sit down and they're going to read it through in a year. Why don't you just sit down and work on reading it? You work on reading it. You know what might happen? I never sit down. Uh, somebody gave me a book while I was up there in Ohio. It's about, I don't know, yay thick or so. It has to do with a war that Stalin was in and says a lot of historical things about that. It's about that thick. I started reading the first little bit of it on the plane and stuff like that. I never sat down when I started reading it and said, well, I'm going to read this thing in 30 days. But what's interesting to me is, is that when it comes to things for the Lord, we always put a time limit on it. I've told you that whenever you put a time limit on things, you add to the equation, you add pressure to an equation that otherwise doesn't need to be there. Some days I feel like reading more than other days. Some days I have more time to read than I do other days. Some days I do good just to get a little bit in. I usually get in more than John 11.35, but some days... I have to rely on some of the things that I know. You say, do you feel bad about it or guilty? No, I just know that maybe tomorrow I'll pick up a little more. But there's nothing worse if you've set a goal for yourself to read, say, 10 chapters a day, and then you've gone through five days and you've been in and out of the hospital and in and out of the doctor and you've been in and out of having trouble with the kids and problems at work and this and that and the other and driving back and forth for kingdom come and you come to the end of the week and it's Saturday night and you're 60 verses behind or 60 chapters behind. You feel like an absolute failure. Yes, sir. Well, did you not trust in the Lord in all your ways? Well, I trusted the Lord. Lord, I didn't intentionally leave you out, but today I had to get up and go to the hospital at 3 o'clock in the morning. This morning, Lord, they had a flat tire. The car didn't start. This morning, I had to take the kids to school. This morning, one of the kids got up with the flu and had a problem. I had to take them to the dock in the box to get some antibiotics and things. I've been nursing a kid that's been sick all afternoon. I haven't had time. Well, did you not acknowledge the Lord? Sure, you acknowledge the Lord. Lord, you need to help me. You need to do something for me. But I didn't have time to sit down and read. Well, that's a good time to do what these kids did. Quote John 3.16. I mean, you'll never get to the bottom of that passage anyway. What does that do? That takes pressure off of you. Do you think that your wife sends you or your husband sends you a love letter and then says, you better read it or I'll kill you? Well, you probably aren't going to want to have a whole lot of romance there, right? Well, I took the time to write it. Shouldn't you take the time? Well, now I've got to read it because I feel guilty or because I'm being forced? No. You know what you want? You want somebody to read it because they can't wait to get in a place where they can sit down and enjoy reading it and in their mind think about how much you love whoever it is that wrote you the letter. Well, that's what you got there. It's not just a rule book. It's not just negativity. It's something that becomes a way of life for you, ladies and gentlemen. You know what fear will do to you? Fear will make you be so careful about each of your steps that when the Lord says, here I am, come on, follow me, you'll be like, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm not really sure. I, I, I'm not positive. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. God's not going to call you to jump off the pinnacle of the temple. I don't believe in that foolishness. I don't believe God calls you and says, you know, where God guides, He provides. That's true. But listen, ladies and gentlemen, when God has decisions for you to make, you be honest, hasn't He given you little opportunities to make those decisions before He asks you to do something big? And by the time that big decision comes, come on now, be honest, that big decision is really not that big. He's been giving you little bites all along the way and you've seen Him come through time and time and time again. And somebody looks at that big decision and goes, man, that was a big decision. You're like, no, it was just the next progression and steps that I was making. You say, why? Because I'm acknowledging Him and He's directing my steps. The steps of a good man are ordered to the Lord, right? Okay, that means one step at a time. If I'm holding the light out, the light is the Lord is a lamp to my feet and the light to my path, then that means that all I'm doing, the, the, the Word of God is, that means every time I take a step, I get a little bit more light. If I don't, I stay stagnated. So, well, at least I got the light. Okay, if you're happy doing that, then camp out right there, I guess, for a while. Sometimes you get stagnated. You say, why? You stop walking. 
If you learn to wait upon the Lord, you know what will happen? You'll find yourself walking with Him. You'll find yourself running with Him. You'll find yourself flying when everybody else is wind up walking and running. The Bible teaches you something, ladies and gentlemen, and what that is is, is I still have to have an element of faith after I get saved, and fear will staunch that. You know, why are we able to get into the building? I hate to use it, and it'll continue to be used for a while until we get accustomed to it. I look around this thing here this evening, and I'm thinking to myself, how did we get in here? A multitude of steps over a multitude of years of just following God the way He had us to do it, and then we're where we're supposed to be. There was no big move, no big drive, no big you know crescendo, no big... It's just little bitty steps all along the way, and now the next thing you know what we're doing? We're sitting in here in pews. How, how, how does that happen? That's God that did that. How did He do it? One step at a time. Nobody came across and said, hey, here's $10 million. Hurry up and get a building built. And then we got in here and got everything moving. I mean, we're still trying to get the pieces working and trying to get the lighting right and trying to get the sound right and trying to get all these other things that are going on. Well, preacher, how did you wind up there? Uh, we wound up here one step at a time. If you learn to just follow the Lord today, you'll be where you ought to be tomorrow. If you could learn to do that, you say, fear of what? Fear of failure. What if I mess up? What if I didn't? Just, just try. Just do the best you can do. The Lord is not an ogre like many people have painted him out to be, sitting up there with a baseball bat wrapped in bob wire with nails in it, and he just can't wait to just knock the tar out of you when you mess up. He wants to see you succeed. That's why he gave you so many things that's in that Bible. Ladies and gentlemen, in spite of what you may believe, when I get a little jacked up every now and then, I want to see every one of you cross the finish line. I don't want to see you get out. I don't want to see you quit. I don't want to see you throw in the towel. I don't want to see... I mean, I may have a funny way of going at it, but I want to see you succeed. I'm not interested in, in having another Christian casualty for my, the benefit of my reputation. I want to see you make it. I want to see you cross the finish line. I want to see you finish in fellowship with Jesus Christ. And you say, well, preacher, sometimes you kind of crack the whip a little bit. I'm still a human being. I, I won't tell you I do everything perfect all the time, but I can tell you my heart's pure as a driven snow when it comes to wanting to see you succeed. What benefit is to the body of Christ to see you get out? Doesn't help anybody at all. Are y'all hot already? Oh my goodness, no blankets. Now, okay, I don't, I don't have who's... Where's Brother Holland at? Could you take care of that, please, sir? Thank you. Electronic, I guess. Well, praise the Lord. <laughs> Brother, in the future, when you see this many fans going, oh, it's all this side. So maybe I need to concentrate my preaching over here a little more. Maybe you folks are, you know, y'all are the, your pastor's Jack Frost or something here. You're in the middle, you don't count, you're lay Odyssea, man. You're neither hot nor cold, man. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 54. Okay, enough of that. <laughs> Isaiah 54. Ain't that a blessing though? Now think about this. You got a little bit heated up. Y'all are sending me messages. Isn't it a blessing that I was able to pick up what you put down? <laughs> I wish y'all were good at doing that. Ain't that a blessing that all we have to do is send a signal and he sends a signal and listen right now. Listen to that. Now, now ask your behind a question right now. Ain't it a blessing to be sitting on padding and it's not all yours? I mean, I don't care how much padding you got on your back end. Ain't it nice to have a padded pew? Come on, be honest. Even you skinny behinds, isn't it nice to have a padded pew? You little bony behind you. <laughs> Y'all think, yeah, mm-hmm. It's nice to have a pad, ain't it? You lean back up against that thing. You say, well, that is, that's a lumbar support. You say, well, what do you think about that? Uh, it help your, helps your back, help you sit longer. What is that? That's a blessing. You folks have paid for all this. You folks have paid for all this. I know God's done all that. The floor and the beautiful stone and the furniture and all that stuff, that's made possible because you decided to do something about it and made a difference. That's a testimony to the world. 
It's a testimony that everybody drives by in a time where everything's driving up and people are not even having services on Sunday night and Wednesday night and you folks are building a building. They're driving by here thinking, what is wrong with those people? No, what's right with those people? You say, what are you doing? One step at a time. One step at a time. One step at a time. Are you in the book of Isaiah? I'm overwhelmed with that, man. I can't even believe it. Isaiah chapter number 54, fear causes a magnification of giants. Fear causes you to look at things from the wrong perspective. Amen. Isaiah chapter number 54, look in verse 17. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Now I'll use that passage to give you a little bit of a promise there, but over in 1 Samuel chapter uh, 17, in 1 Samuel 17, you got the story of David and Goliath. And what happens there is, is Goliath comes out every day, and you all know the story, and you tell it as a, a story. They're going to use it, I guess, some during the vacation Bible school thing. But David goes down there with some wine and some cheese and stuff to feed his brothers, and Goliath comes out cursing and swearing. And David says, who in the cat here is this guy here cursing and swearing in the name of God and making fun of our God, man? I mean, somebody's not going to do anything about it. You know what fear does? Fear will keep you in the ditch when there's a cause. How come David was the only one? Saul stood head and shoulders. I mean, if anybody should have been out there fighting the giant, Saul should have gone out there. I mean, you know, if I go out there and lose the fight, at least I died fighting for something worth dying for. Right? Right? So David shows up there and he says, uh, what's his brother's name there? Is it Eliab? I can't remember. It's on the left-hand side there. I think it's Eliab. Is an elder brother there. And, and he says to his brother, he said, man, what in the world? How come somebody doesn't? You don't realize who he's cursing? He's cursing God. Why don't y'all do something about it? Eliab says, who are you, you little shepherd boy, you little punk? Who do you are to come in here and tell us you don't know nothing about war? You don't know nothing about battle? You know what they're doing? They're trying to discourage them from fighting Goliath. They're trying to keep him in the ditch. Who are you to go to the mission field? Who are you to go to Bible school in Pensacola? Who are you to take Bible courses? Who are you after you've been on the bench for a long time to go back to Bible school and get Christian studies or, or get you a degree and that kind of a thing? I mean, who do you think you are? Stay in the ditch with the rest of us cowards. That's what fear does to you. The fear of what? The fear of failure. The fear of the giants. It magnifies them. Uh, Joshua and Caleb come back there, man. They say, man, you wouldn't believe that place over there. Uh, the grapes as big as basketballs, man. I mean, you talk about a land full of milk and honey. I mean, let's get the battle plans together. Let's go. And the ten come in and go, man, them things over there, those are giants in the land, and we're like grasshoppers. You know what happens? It cost them 40 years because of the giants in the land. Joshua and Caleb got to go over there. You say, why? They went over there and said, man, I'm going to tell you what. We can take them. We can take them. Let's go. You know what the cowards said? Let's stay in the ditch. Let's preserve our life. At some point in time, you know what will happen? You have to come to grips with fear. Sure, it requires faith to step out. And trust me when I tell you, even if the Lord maps everything out for you the way it needs to be mapped out, it still requires faith on your part to step out. Yes. God called you to go to college. I can't imagine how that must be. I'm thinking about her up here singing. It's a miracle she made it through the first year of school. You say what? Have you looked at college campuses lately? I mean, you better make sure you know why it is you're going and who it is you're going for. I don't care what college campus is. If the numbers I'm getting are correct, you say what? You used to say, well, that's the pathway to success anymore. It might lead to your demise. You say what? You better pray and trust the Lord while you're there. But you know what everybody else will say? Well, you better not do that. You better not do that. What happens if? What happens if? Yeah, well, what happens if I trust the Lord with all my heart, lead not to my own understanding, and all my ways I acknowledge Him and He directs my path? Would you like me to sit at home with you because it makes you more comfortable or would you like me to go and experience what it is to learn to walk with Jesus Christ and to get out there and do what God would have me to do. Might I mess up? Yeah, but I might make it too. I might get through to the other side. How about we get behind him and pray for him more and support him more instead of watch out, watch out, watch out for the giant. Watch out for the giant. There's giants. Oh, there's giants. There's giants. Hey, how about you pray? Hey, if you get a giant, they got a sling. Here's you a couple of smooth stones. If you got a giant, here's my phone number. Call me. We know some people in some places. We still got some skills. We can still help you out. 
I mean, you know, we'll get out the ninja suit and get it out of mothballs, but we got some help for you. I mean, you ever pause to think about that? If maybe often more than not, we were a wind in their sails and not a boat anchor around their neck, that maybe some of these kids might get on and get through the thing. You say, why? It is the older people that are in the ditch that are always talking about the giants. Watch out for the giant. Watch out for the giants. Watch out for the giant. David said, shoot man, giants, are you kidding me? Why, when I was a little shepherd boy, I killed me a bear and a lion. If he was from the south, he said a bar and a lion. And he said, I grabbed that bar by the beard and I, I stuck him two or three times. He fell out dead as a doornail. The lion come out about me and I led with the left and led with the right and I hooked him and came up underneath him and I gutted him out and took my sheep right out of his mouth. And he said, this guy's a human being. They're animals. They're trained fighters. Why, wow, this guy's been training from his youth up. That's just justification and not just justify. Do you ever realize sometimes there's some hills worth dying on? Do you ever realize that there's something like dying for that Bible? I think that's the right thing to do. That's my conviction about that. A dying for living a life that when I die, I meet Jesus Christ and I'm glad to see Him not hiding from Him. I believe teaching about going home to heaven is an important thing for you to be ready for at any moment at any time. I think that's worth dying for. Dying for politics. What a stupid thing to do. I can't imagine that. I'm not dying for my party. Somebody was telling me today we were already out of songbooks and stuff like that. We got all the songbooks that we need. And they said, well, I think they're making them in blue now. Miss Joni is the one running, looking for them and things like that. And I said, if you get blue hymnals in here and we got red hymnals in here, somebody will think we're having some for Democrats and some for Republicans. <laughs> you'll, turn it into something, you'll turn it into something political sure as I'm standing here. Which side is the blue side and which side is the red side? You know what? Well, let's just make them all purple, preacher, and then that way we'll mat. We ain't making nothing purple, you hear me? That's as close to the rainbow as we're ever getting around here. Amen. You might get you a bag of Skittles, but you ain't having no rainbow here unless it's to talk about Noah. Ladies and gentlemen, do you realize sometimes that the people that are always telling you about the giants and the giants, that that fear of giants can keep you in the ditch? I mean, who would ever want to try anything if you're always worrying about giants? You say, well, preacher, I, I'm wore out. All they're doing is just, they're just constantly talking about the giants in the land. You know what I know? That means you're going to be wandering in the wilderness for a while. Yes. How long? Maybe till you're dead. Yes. I've known many a dead individuals. I've known many individuals walking around and they just keep going around in circles and going around in circles. You know what those individuals in that ditch will do? They'll say, well, okay, David, if you killed a bear and a lion, I guess we're going to go ahead and let you go out there and fight. i tell you what you need to do. Uh, we're going to show you our support for you, David. Uh, we're going to give you Saul's armor. Give me Saul's armor. Well, sure. Do you ever think about this? Do you ever realize Saul's the one that said he'd give him Saul's armor? Do you know why? Everybody knew the king's armor. You know what he's looking for? He's looking for a straw man to go out there and look like it's Saul going out to fight. And that way, if he has any success, they'd be able to say, man, Saul went out to battle. Saul went out to battle. Saul went out to battle. David put that stuff on. He said, man, this stuff's too big for me. This stuff weighs too much. I mean, I'm going in the name of the Lord. I'm not going in the name of Saul. I don't need all this. I've never fought anything in my life with all of this stuff that's untried, untested, unproven. What do you got that's proven, David? I got a sling and some rocks. I can knock a fly off of a pedestal down there at a hundred yards. And well, David, that's a giant that's been trained. Yeah, but I got God on my side. What's he got? Well, I don't know. He's a giant. He's a giant. He's holding an entire army at bay that God has blessed since the beginning of the time of the nation of Israel. And that one man is holding him at bay. And David said, I'll be dumped, jumped. And he said, I don't need all this stuff. And he goes out there. You know what that Bible says when he gets ready to go out there to fight? That that big old Goliath looked down there at him and he disdained him. He said, man, they send some little punk, little pipsqueak like you down here to take me out. I mean, the audacity of that man. I'll eat shrimps like you for breakfast. And David said, well, I'm not coming in my own name and don't be fooled by my size and don't be fooled by my age and I realize that even my own people aren't for me. But if God's with me, who can be against me? And he begins to sling it. And the boy says, what do you need? He says, man, I don't even need a helmet to fight you. And David said, okay, he's undeterred. And that giant gets up, man, and grabs that spear, man, and he gets ready to go toward David and make a shishky bob out of him. And all of a sudden, David goes... 
and that thing hits him right square between the eyes, and that giant who left his helmet behind because he doesn't need it. He falls over, and he's not dead yet, and David makes sure of it. He goes over and decapitates him with his own sword. Holds that thing up. And now the whole nation of Israel is not afraid of the giant anymore. Because one man wasn't afraid of the giant. Ladies and gentlemen, in spite of what you may think of anybody that's ever done anything, you're going to find moments in their life where they had to kill a giant in order to accomplish anything for the Lord. You ever accept a call to preach? You had to kill a giant. You say, why? Somebody told you you weren't called to preach. You ever accept a call to go to school? Somebody told you you shouldn't go. You ever killed the giant of an improper witness when the Lord says to you to witness and somebody says, well, no, I don't know about that. You have to kill the giant of pride, don't you? Reputation. You got to reach in that pocket and... Uh, can I give you something to read? <laughs> the big giant. What about the giants? What about the giants? What are they going to say? You ever have that giant sit on your chest in the mornings up there when you walk into your office and you take that Bible and you put it up there on your desk? And you're not having a fellowship of Christian athletes meeting where everybody walks in with one? Right. Mm -hmm. And they walk in and say, what is that? That's my Bible. I read it every day. Amen. You don't? The giant, ain't it? Come on, well, preacher, that's not popular nowadays. It's funny how popular it gets at time of death. <laughs> All of a sudden, everybody wants to get that book out. Let me show you something in 2 Chronicles 20. I'll try not to be too long tonight. Last time I said that, my wife rolled her eyes and she said, Oh boy, that means we'll be here till stinking midnight. Look in uh, 2 Chronicles. I believe it's 2 Chronicles. Let me give you a couple of things to do when you get in fear. You feel defeated and you feel wore out. The first thing you want to do is, is check out and make sure that, you're, uh, that the fear doesn't have the better of you. What's going to happen? What's going to happen? You ever have the Lord deal with you about a particular thing and He asks you to trust Him on it and you have that apprehension about stepping out? I'm not talking about caution. Sure. Please understand again, I'm not talking about jumping off the pinnacle of the temple. When they came up there and asked the Lord about jumping off the pinnacle of the temple, you know what the Lord said? Get thee behind me, Satan. Yes. Well, Lord, don't you know in the Bible it says that if you jump off that He'll send His angels to catch thee and you'll not dash your heel upon the rock and this and that and the other? Yeah, that's what the Bible says. And you're talking about an entirely different time and dispensation. That's why it's important to have the Bible in the right places. And everything Satan is telling the Lord is the right thing, but it's at the wrong time. Yes. The Lord was a dispensationalist. I don't care what anybody tells you. Oh, dispensations are the devil. and Dispensations are, are demonic doctrine and that kind of stuff. You can't make sense of the Bible without that. The Lord, uh, the temptation of the Lord, all three of those things were the right thing at the wrong time. Turn the stones to bread. That happens out in the tribulation. I'll give you all these kingdoms. That happens at the second coming of Christ there uh, when the battle of Armageddon takes place and he comes down to rule and reign. Uh, jump off the pinnacle of the temple. That takes place at the second advent. You say, what is it? He's trying to get him to hurry up. He's trying to get him to hurry up. Speed it up. Speed it up. Speed it up. Quicker, quicker, quicker. Uh, years and years and years ago, the old preacher said something. This is the last time I heard him say it. He did something in 1971. I would have still been uh, just finishing up high school there. In 1971, here's what he said. He was still at Brent Baptist Church. Here's what he said. He said, one of the most damnable things that has ever occurred is the invention of television. And here's why. Not for the reasons you might think. He said, the reason is, is because in a 30 minute or one hour show, you might run 50 hours of time, or one hour, and run 50 years of lifetime in about a two hour span of time in a movie. He said, nobody lives that fast. And he said, now the only thing that's really real, he said, is a soap opera. A black lady said to him one time, he said, preacher, I like soap operas. She said, why is that? He said, it's the only time you get to see white people suffer. <laughs> that's funny. Amen, sister, you're right. When was the last time you saw a black soap opera? You white people think you're the only ones that have trouble. <laughs> Y'all don't know how to act on that. Y'all are, I'm just, I'm just pausing for effect. That thing, the, the camera just started smoking. It's like, can you say that out there? Sure you can say that. You say, what is it? Everybody, but you know what that thing runs? That thing runs in real time. Yeah. 
That's how life is. Life is sometimes sag, bag, and drag, isn't it? All right, you know what happens? A TV comes along and you'll see an individual born or come out there as a kid and he's in elementary school and by the time you're done an hour later, that person's dead and in a box. You know what happens every time that you want to get something going? You always want to speed it up. That's the old man. That's not me. Don't give me any credit for any wisdom. You know what happens? Every time you speed it up, that's why you like cocaine. That's why you like crack. That's why you like speed. That's why you like binge. You say, why? It speeds it up. Speed it up. Speed it up. Faster, faster, faster. Quicker, quicker. And whenever you do that, you know what you do? Every time you sacrifice accuracy for speed. Every time. Got to get it quicker. Got to have it quicker. Got to have it quicker. There's Aiken. Got to have it now. Need it now. Got to have it. Got to have it. Got to have it. Got to have it. You know what he said? That's the thing that ruined people. And he said the generation that's coming up now, he said they think they should have as soon as they get out of high school what took their parents 70 years to get. And I thought, 1971 he said that. And I thought, that's profound. I wrote it down. I thought, man, that's profound. You say, what happens? You graduate from high school and think you're supposed to be starting at the top of some company. Your mom and daddy used to work sweeping floors and washing dishes and work their self through the company until they got to be the big dog at the top of the palace by the time they got gray hair or no hair. And now what happens is you get out of college, you think, hey, hey man, I'm the big dog. And I thought, man, I'm going to write that one down. You better watch it, Peacock. Every time you get in a hurry, you're headed for trouble. Speed, 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 faster, faster, faster. You can't live a life in an hour. You know the hardest thing to do? I talked to a friend of mine, a dear friend of mine this morning. I was talking to him about some things along these lines. You know what I said? I said, every time we try to accomplish more than God wants us to accomplish in a shorter period of time than He asked for us to do it, we always wind up in trouble. You say what? Because the ministry, as the old preacher said, is routine duty. And what is routine duty? Sag, bag, and drag, man. I mean, here we are again. After however many years I've been here, you're hearing the same preaching from the same book, singing the same hymns. Sis gets up here and sings a song. I say, you've heard that song I don't know how many times. Don't tell me that thing didn't minister to you. Say, well, let's, get, let's get on with it. Let's get on with it. Let's hurry up. Let's move out. Every time you do that, you know what happens? You sacrifice accuracy for speed. You say, what happens with this? It's boring sometimes. It's a drag sometimes. Sometimes the preacher's off a half a bubble. It's not very entertaining. It's kind of just dry. And you're thinking, man, preacher, I mean, you couldn't you put a little bit more effort in that thing? And I mean, couldn't you just pizzazz it up? So what they do in contemporary places is they pizzazz it up by getting you jacked up on the music. And then you ride the music high while the guy gets up there and gives you 30 minutes of nothing. And you're thinking, boy, what a great service. You're still riding the high. You're still buzzing from the song service. Yep. And you're up there because of the hopping and the bopping and the buzzing and the and all the bass and all the other kind of stuff going on in the dim lights and the dark places and all that. You think you've been to a rock and roll concert and the guy gets up there and he says, Mary had a little lamb. And you're like, yeah, wow. You walk out of there like you've been watching an Ozzy Osbourne concert or ACDC or Rollins, whoever's out there. I got no idea who's out there or country people, Garth Brooks, or who's, who's the country people nowadays? You know, don't you lie. <laughs> Y'all are like, oh, I don't, I don't know. Who, who, whoever they are. They're the ones out there, they're bilingual. You say what? They have two languages. You say, was that English and Spanish? No, no. Every country singer knows how to sing forward and backward. <laughs> He gets everything and then he loses everything. And then he plays the record backwards and he gets it all backward. He gets it all back again. And it's the same stuff that was around when Hank Williams was out there. And Mr. I Saw the Light. And Johnny Cash. Hello. My name's Johnny Cash. Well, that's what the sign says. Why do you have to introduce yourself? You know... My illustrations need polish, I guess. You ever been afraid? You ever been afraid to follow the Lord? And take on the responsibility that He gives you and everybody else says, I don't know about that. It's funny how they'll take liberties with your life they won't take with their own. Any of you ever have a kid? <laughs> Ain't it funny how everybody's an expert with your kid? 
Come on, Brother Mitch, help me out a little bit. Don't just nod your head. You got that old Carolina, you, you know, yes, sir, I know what that's like. You know, well, you can say it and hear you're part of us now. <laughs> you ever have a kid? You ever realize how they're an expert with everything you ought to do? I ain't used to this yet. You ever notice that? You ever notice how they're an expert with your life and you're the one that has to pay the price? They always got great advice for you. You ever notice that? But they don't have to live with the repercussions. But they sure want to share in the reward. Well, if I was you, I don't believe I'd go to school over there. Really? Well, what if God told me to go to school? Well, you know, you, I, I, what I would do if I was you, well, you ain't me. Now, what do I do when I'm afraid? I'm going to give you a couple of things here real quick, if we could, please. You've heard the, uh, a message on this years ago, I think. Look in uh, chapter 20 of Second Chronicles, and uh, Moab and Ammon are coming up here against the children of Israel. They're going to come against Jehoshaphat to fight. I'm in Second Chronicles chapter 20, page 507 in an old Schofield Bible. And he said, There cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond, verse number 2, beyond the sea of the side Syria, behold, has raisin, uh, raisin Tamar and En Gedi. And Jehoshaphat feared, I guess so, and set himself to do what? No, he had to call all the people and figure out what we need to do. You know what step number one is, if you want to take a note or two? Step number one, when you are faced against insurmountable odds, before you do anything, you set your face to seek the Lord. Now, I'm going to show you, he's going to give you a principle here that's gone the way of the American Indian. But before you take matters into your own hand, pause. Don't get in a hurry. You're about to make a mistake. You say, what does he do? He feared, he set himself to seek the Lord, and then did what? Proclaimed, uh, man, that's hard for Baptists. Amen. You say, why? We like to eat. We don't drink, we don't smoke, we don't cuss, and we're going to go with the other ones that do. But man, I mean, we can put on the dog. If there was an eating contest, put a Baptist up there in any other religion, and we're going to beat them hands down. Because we know how to eat, right? We have reasons to eat for everything we do. You sick? Eat. You feel depressed? Eat. Are you happy? You should eat. <laughs> Your team won? Eat. Your team lost? You definitely got to eat. What are we going to do every time you get ready to have everything? Why, vacation Bible school? Got to have it catered, need food. What do you got to have if you're going to have food? Got to have dessert, right? We know how to eat. You know what he said? If you're really looking for the Lord, if you're afraid, you're insurmountable odds, how many of you have said, you know what I need to do? I need to push away from the table now. I need to put aside my physical needs, my physical desires, because the decision I'm about to make is going to require supernatural intervention, and I need God to intervene. A lot more than just prayer. It's showing God you're serious. Now, I, you're, you kids, if you're little kids, you need to have your parents be signed off on that thing, so don't misunderstand what I'm about to say. But if you're enough up in age that you've been saved for a while, kids, you need to learn the power of fasting. It's not going to kill you to miss a meal or two. Now, if you're diabetic and you've got other problems and notes from your doctors, and I'm not talking about being foolish now, but I'm simply saying to you, ladies and gentlemen, this isn't about fasting for your health. It's not a dry fast or a water fast or a vegetable. It's none of that. It's I'm trying to get a hold of the Lord. What am I doing? I'm setting aside my physical needs because I've got an insurmountable problem facing me and I need to find out what God's going to do with this. And can I tell you this? Sometimes God will give you an answer and it ain't the answer you want to hear. Sometimes, you know what He'll say to you? He'll say to you, yep, uh, your goose is cooked. Well, Lord, I prayed and fasted about it, okay? And I gave you an answer. And the answer is going to be, no, I'm not going to deliver you. you going in the furnace. So what are you going to do about that? Okay, Lord, give me grace to get through the furnace. At least now I know where I'm headed. You say, preacher, I never heard such that. The Apostle Paul said, in hundreds and fasting often. You don't think he fasted over the problem with his eyes? You don't think that he had good reason to feel that way? Caught up to the third heaven, beheld things. He is uh, unspeakable. He comes back down here and the Lord says, uh, Paul says, that I not be exalted above measure? The Lord gave me a thorn in the flesh, a minister of Satan to buffet me. And I besought the Lord thrice and asked the Lord to take it. And the Lord's answer was, nope, my grace is sufficient for thee. When uh, you're weak, I'm strong. Paul said, I will therefore glory in tribulation. You say, Paul, didn't Paul pray? Yeah. Isn't Paul your apostle? Yeah. Don't you follow Paul's he followed Christ? Yeah. 
Do you follow him when you don't get the answer you wanted to hear? The Lord said, no, Paul, I'm not taking the thorn out of your flesh. It's for my glory that you got it. You know what? Paul never discusses it again. That's an amazing thing to me about the Apostle Paul. You know how we usually are. If God doesn't answer how we think we are, then we start talking about God all the time. Well, I don't know why God did that. I just don't understand why God did that. Because God's smarter than you and I. God knows what's best for us. The Lord took my dad at 64 years of age. Do you understand it? No, I don't understand it. I don't understand it at all. To my knowledge, I didn't know. I mean, I wasn't there all the time. I never saw him doing anything wrong and anything bad, or I couldn't justify any of that other kind of stuff. I look at that thing and say to myself, you know, well, why, Lord? Lord said, because I said. Why? For His glory. I don't know. Jim Lentz, Dr. Ruckman. I mean, it's easier a little bit with Dr. Ruckman. He's 90-something when he goes, 92 or 3, right? But a 64? How about Jim, 54? Pretty young, right? You say, what is that? The Lord put a period at the end of the sentence. You know what He said? He didn't be smart with you. He just said, I chose to do it that way. What do you think about that? Amen. Now, are you going to stay stuck on that and stay bitter the rest of your life? Or are you going to say, okay, well, the Lord knew what He was doing. He knows something I didn't know, so to God be the glory. Amen. It's tough though, isn't it? Number one, he says, sets himself to seek the Lord. Number two, he prays. But I want you to notice this also together. And I mean, he fasts. He notice also together, he claims a fast. It's nothing wrong with getting somebody to pray with you about it. Amen. Nothing wrong to get with somebody and ask them to fast with you. <laughs> Make sure they really love you. Because you're telling them to miss a meal. I'll guarantee you, man, when you start fasting, you know what happens? Your hunger button gets hit. When you start fasting, you know what will happen to you? All of a sudden, you've been fasting 15 minutes. You'll swear you've been fasting 15 hours. That clock slows down, man, and you're thinking, okay, I'm going to fast 24 hours. Must have been 12. It has been 12 seconds. You say, what happens? There's something, there's a dynamic there that changes, and it's not a diet. There's a dynamic that changes when you're doing it for the right reason. You step into another realm and all of a sudden time changes. It elongates. It gets longer. It slows everything down. Fasting doesn't speed things up. It's an oxymoron when they say, I'm going to fast. It does anything but make it faster. It slows everything down. It changes your perspective of it. You ever decided to seek the Lord? You ever fast? Guess what happened? The next thing he does, you wouldn't believe this, would be in the Old Testament. I mean, they're surrounded by their enemies, right? They're fixing to be uh, uh, overrun. They got everybody around them is going to overcome them, right? You know the next thing that the Bible said? Look and see where they went. They went to the movie theater. They went to the ball game. No, I think you look down there around verse number 3. Where did they go? Where, somebody just said it. They went to the house of the Lord. Well, who in the cat here would want to go to the house of the Lord if you're surrounded by an enemy and you're already praying and fasting? I mean, can't God answer you in your living room or on your bed? You say, what does he say? Doesn't he say they went to the house of the Lord? The Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord. Am I, am I reading that right? Yes, sir. Who would have ever thought that am I in a bad situation that you know what I might need to do? I might need to go back to where I most likely run into the Lord. Amen. Yeah. I, I know a, a doctor or two and we have special numbers for all kind of stuff that's going on now and those kind of things. <coughs> Excuse me, but it's an odd thing. If I really need a doctor, I don't expect the doctor to make a house call. Not anymore. You know what I do? I go to the hospital because I'm more likely to find a doctor in the hospital than I am at the rest stop out on I-10. I'm just saying you're more likely to find God in God's house than you are parking your behind in front of the television set even if you are praying and fasting. You say, why? has a tendency to kind of Focus you a little bit, doesn't it? 
And when he stands up there, you know what he says? He begins to look back in the past and he doesn't go back in the past and pick out the bad things that he did. He goes back in the past and he said, remember how God got us through here? Remember how God got us through here? Remember how God got us through right here? Remember we wouldn't even be standing here. We wouldn't even have anything to take if it wasn't for God here. Remember how God did this? You remember how God did this? The Bible said, and they remembered. And they come up across that river over there. That old preacher said, he said, take you some stones and put them up there and make them Ebenezer stones. And remember, the Lord hath provided. Amen. You say, what does that do? Well, it gives, gives you a little bit of body of evidence yes. to say, well, if he got me through there and he got me through there and he got me through there, there's enough evidence to convince me he's probably going to get me through here. Amen. And he starts to, that's a direction of how things are going. It never is bad for you to look back and count the blessings of what God's done for you. I like the song, uh, Count Your Many Blessings, Name Them One by One, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. But when's the last time you did that? Well, here they're doing it and they're in trouble. They're not putting battle plans together, they haven't even started that yet. They're not sharpening their knives and their spears and getting their rocket launchers and getting things ready to go and lock down their ARs and AAKs and all that other kind of foolishness. And that. They're not doing that. You know what they're saying? They're praying, fasting, going to church and remembering how good God's been to them. I mean, if this is the swan song, if this is the, the end of everything, boy, God sure has been good to us up to now. What a blessing. What a great way to go. Been a great ride. Sure has been a blessing. I'm on the right side. If this is the end of it, case sera, sera, I'm headed home to heaven. Boy, sure has been a good ride. You'd be surprised. Fasting will put you in a whole other realm. You're kind of like, well, well, if we go, I guess there's a lot of things worse could happen to us. At least I know where I'm going when I go. And at that point together there, I'll wind up breaking it off here. But you know what he says? Come all the way down in verse number 15. Jehazi or 14, excuse me. <clears throat> they stood there, their eyes are upon them. Neither knew we knew, uh, what to do. We have no might. In verse number 12, our eyes are upon thee. All Judah stood before the Lord and their little ones and their wives and their children. Uh, that doesn't happen much anymore nowadays. Nowadays you've fallen for Pharaoh's uh, way to keep you in Egypt. Nowadays you want to go out and serve the Lord. The Pharaoh says, well, go, but don't go too far. Don't drive from Lake City and Fernandina and Green Cove and Orlando and Green Cove Springs and all that. Don't, don't drive from out on the west side and out on the east side. I mean, don't drive halfway across the country just to get to a church. I mean, get you something that's close and convenient. Okay, you're going to go. That's fine. Well, go ahead and you, you men go ahead and go, but leave your women and children behind. I mean, don't, don't let the women and the children go. That's right there when they're getting ready to go out of here. Okay, all right, well, if you're going to go, that's fine. Take your wives with you, but leave your kids with us. That's what Pharaoh did in Exodus. We'll take care of your kids. We'll raise your kids. We'll watch over your kids. I mean, we're good parents. We're Egypt. We can provide for them. Let us take care of them. Egypt's the type of the world. You and your wife, y'all go ahead and go. Grandparents, y'all go ahead and go. Uh, but let those kids kind of have their own way and do their own thing. Are y'all are y'all cooling off yet? You cooling off? You know. You say, well, but but preacher, yeah. See, that's on. It's not popular nowadays. I was raised on drugs. You say you got to be kidding me. I thought your daddy was a preacher. He was. I was drugged to church since nine months before I was born. Nowadays, it's unpopular. You let a little three or four year old kid tell you whether or not he wants to go to church. The Bible said when they're facing inevitable defeat, he said all of Judah stood and their women and their children. Brainwash them. Or the world will. At least give them a fighting chance. At least help them that when you do have to send them into Egypt, they got something to stand on. Equip them as best you can. Give them a chance. Don't just give them over to Pharaoh. Well, he says, we stand up there and we do what? And then they call a preacher in there. Well, who in the cat here would do that? Well, I mean, you know, the Lord has funny ways of fighting battles, doesn't he? He's yet to raise a spear. 
And then he says this in 14, he says, Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jaleel, the son of Mattaniah, a Levite, the son of Asaph, came the Spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. And he, the preacher, said, Hearken ye, all ye Judah inhabitants of Jerusalem, thou King Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord, be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of the great multitude, for the battle is... Keep your hands off of it there, Jehoshaphat. Keep your hands off of it, Judah. Keep your hands off of it. The battle's God's battle. You get in trouble fighting His battle. Get your paws off of it. Hard to do, isn't it? Can I show you an inevitable defeat that you're going to face? We talked about it a little bit in Sunday school. How about bitterness? That's a battle where your enemies have got you captive and you're surrounded. You know what you do? You won't pray. You won't fast. You won't keep coming to church. And then the next thing that will wind up happening to you is you'll start to fight that thing on your own and before long that root of bitterness will wrap you up and next thing you know you'll be done and completely out. You say, why? You won't give it to God. I told you that in Sunday school. If you weren't here, get the tape or whatever the thing is they put out there. You say, well, why should I do that? Because what I preached on in Sunday school this morning, every Christian needs. Oh, you just think you're real. No, I'm saying you don't really want fellowship with the Lord because you'll let that bitterness bury you. And you'll justify doing it. The Lord warns you about that and the Lord warns you and the Lord warns you and we're like, well, I, I know, I know what he says about that, but I just feel like I can handle it better than he can handle it. Uh, he is a, a master tactician. They say, I don't know for sure, I've read a few books on it and those kind of things. I'm certainly not an export at, expert at it. But they say that General Lee, I'm not refighting the war and the causes for the war, just making an illustration. They say that General Lee, the reason that he was so effective was is that he was able to take small groups of individuals and because he was such a great tactician that he was able to take insurmountable odds and almost supernaturally turn those things in his favor and win a multitude of, of uh, battles against armies that were much larger, sometimes as many as much as four times larger than his army. You say, well now, what is that? Well, it's a lot of wisdom somebody must have given him. Must somebody that's able to do that. Well, if he was that good at and over to able to overcome insurmountable odds, and if David could whoop Goliath and he's going in the name of the Lord, you don't think God can take your problem and fix it? But you know what he won't do? He won't take it from you. I'm not going to do it, but we ought to have an altar call and see if you'd be willing to lay whatever that thing is and be willing to come up here and put it on the altar and get something and write it on a piece of paper and come down here and put it on the altar and leave it there on the altar. And just leave it right there. Leave it there for a week or so and see if you left it there for a week and then two weeks and then three weeks and then a month and say, no, he's still got it. He's still got it. I hadn't touched it. I hadn't touched it. And see if it ain't a life changer. See if it doesn't change what you're looking at. Well, you know what happens in that thing? The Lord said, why, y'all go on out there and fight the battle, but leave your spears behind. <laughs> that doesn't even make any sense. Leave your shields, leave your sport swords, leave your spears. You don't need any of that stuff. I'm going to take care of them. Why, by the time you get there, you know what you don't know until you get to the end of Second Chronicles chapter number 20? You don't know why the Lord didn't want them carrying any spears and shields. Do you know why? Because when they got to the battlefield, all the enemy was slain. And when they got out there and saw that all the enemy was slain, they had all that spoil there. And if they'd have had a spear and a shield, they wouldn't have had both hands to carry away all the stuff. God said, go over there empty-handed. Why? You're going to be bring, bringing back more than you can even imagine. You say, why? You trusted in me with all thine heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all thy ways you acknowledge me, and I directed your path. And they come back there, and the Bible says, now, here's what I want you to do. He said, uh, there's a chief singer that's over here and he's going to start a hymn. It's probably the one she was singing tonight. He's going to start a hymn right there. And when he starts singing, y'all just start singing. Mm -hmm. And you come into that second column there on that left-hand page, you know what it says? And when they begin to sing and to shout for joy, the Lord set ambushments against the enemy and He overtook the enemy. When they begin to act as if they'd already won the battle. 
a bunch of charismatics out there. We got the victory. We got the victory. We got the victory. <laughs> and, they, and the Lord said, okay, my people believe me. Boom. You know what happened with uh, Jericho? March around seven times and then you march around seven times. And on the last day, you come around seven times and on that seventh time, you shout. And they did that and the Lord waited until He heard the shout and He said, what happened? The walls came down. Amen. Seven times. What is that? Routine duty. Monotony. What are we doing? Just marching. Keep your mouth shut. Don't say nothing. You know how hard that is? You imagine walking around. I've seen the city. I've been to the city of Jer Jericho. You know how hard it is walk around the whole city of Jericho and not say a word? That'd be a difficult thing, wouldn't it? And then the last day, you're only allowed to shout. And you shout and the walls come tumbling down. I said, well, I'll be jumped. Look at that. You say, what happens in that thing? Why wow, they begin to do that. And the Bible says, and uh, the joy of the Lord returned. They returned with the joy of the Lord. And there was peace round about. Where did it start? Prayer, fasting, church, trusting. That's the key to overcoming fear. There's nothing like it. it. It's the best trip you've ever been on in your life. You realize you're out there, man, and you're doing what God wants you to do, and sometimes you feel like it's just you and Him, and you're walking with Him, and He's walking with you, and you're thinking... A pretty good ride, Lord. And He does something supernatural for you like that. You better write it down. You'll forget it. That's the key to overcome.